Are you planning on selling your home in Spokane, Washington? Well, this is the right video for you. In today's video, we're going to cover everything that you need to know to get the most out of your selling process and get top dollar for your home. Welcome back to Living in Spokane, Washington. If you're new here, my name is Hunter McKay and I'm a local real estate broker of 10 years. Whether you're just considering moving to the area or already a longtime local and want to hear my opinion, we love having all of you on the channel. Make sure to leave me a like and a comment, or if you just want to message me, my information is down below. Now let's get into today's video and cover all of the most important things that I think should be considered when getting ready to sell your home in Spokane. So first off, obviously real estate tends to be a I need to move kind of situation. There aren't always a time where someone gets to say, I want to move, what's the best way? And so if you're currently considering moving because of a life change or a job change or something emotional and mental that's keeping you on your life path, the correct answer is to get moving as soon as possible. The reason that I say that is because this is a part of your life, not your entire life. Maximizing your asset and failing at maintaining your mental and emotional well-being is always a loss because you are the one generating your life. And so the rest of these commentaries are really meant for people who just kind of want to move. They think that they need to, and they're wanting to maximize every aspect of this decision. And so they have time to put together a plan. If you don't have time, call the real estate broker tomorrow or right now, call me and say, I really need help. How do I maximize it? And then you give me the reins and we can take care of it. This guide is if we have time. So let's take a look. One of the first big ones to consider is market condition. And what do I mean by market condition? I really mean two things. How well are buyers able to afford the thing that they want to buy and how much inventory like that thing exists. If you're a super unique home, you can sell at almost any time of the year, as long as someone wants to buy you. If you're a super unique home and no one likes you, then that's actually not a good thing. And so in order to maximize your home sale as a seller, I would always be thinking about what's the buyer experience right now? Can they afford to pay as much money as I want them to for my home? Some of the things that can make the biggest difference to buyers can be the interest rate and the time of year. Let's face it, we live in Spokane, so who wants to move in December approaching Christmas? Absolutely no one. And so I tend to recommend that between Thanksgiving and January 5th, that we don't list new properties. A lot of people disagree with me that there are always people looking and so you should get advantage and take time when you can. I simply think that in Spokane, people take time off between Thanksgiving and New Year's and there's a lot less buyers out, there's a lot more snow on the ground and there's a lot of shorter weeks indicating that m more time will take in order to get everything done. People are on vacation, people are taking longer weekends, people are saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm just really busy because the holidays have gotten to me. And when all of those things stack, home prices go down because it takes longer, people are less interested, less engaged, and the negotiations are happening more slowly, allowing buyers to be more picky. If you list in spring, by comparison, April through June are some of the busiest times in Spokane. Prices increase, sun is out, dopamine is high, and people are able to move because there's no snow on the ground. And so it's just a massive difference. There's also more inventory in spring though. So you have to compare, am I going to be one of 15 houses that's launching in March or April? If so, maybe I should list a little bit earlier, that way I can be first to market. If I know I'm a unique property no matter what, and I'm a coveted unique property, I might wait until April to make sure that I can maximize everyone's dopamine. That way they want to pull out their wallet and pay me the maximum that they can. Preparing your home is another one that I really want to dive into. When you've lived in your home for a really long time, there are going to be issues that you've learned to ignore. It's just a fact of life. Things break, we get used to them, and we don't always fix everything to 100%. If it's good enough for us and we can get day by day through our, our life, we might not opt to take time out of our busy schedule. Unfortunately, this leaves sellers in a position where they think, well, my home is good enough and surely I can price it similarly to other priced homes and others in their condition and it'll all work out. That's not always true in every market. In 2020 to 2022, I could have listed a complete dog pile of a home on the market and listed it for any price and people would have come to see it because there wasn't enough inventory. And so maybe the price was wrong, but they would always go and look at it. If I did that same process today, 
my listings would get a lot less traction. Today, we have more inventory and buyers are pickier. And so when you go on Zillow and you see 50 home options instead of five, you become a lot more persnickety about what you're willing to accept. And so if you're a homeowner and you're thinking about bringing your home to market, fix everything. Don't let any of the small issues that you already know about become a big issue to the buyer because the buyer is going to find all of their own problems because their life is designed towards finding the things that will impact them. Your life has been designed towards finding the things that impact you. They may not be the same. So clean up your home, get it ready to go. You could even do a pre-home inspection and correct some of the bigger issues. That way you can show how serious you are to the potential home buyer. That will provide them a lot of willingness from your end that shows your home is in great shape and that will shift their psychology and cause them to want to pay more for your home than other homes on the market. One of the things that's really different from every agency is marketing and how they price something. I've worked for a lot of different companies, a lot of different firms, and I've tutored under a lot of amazing mentors, and I'm always shocked how everyone has a different opinion on how to price something. For me, I'm not looking at the true appraised value. I don't want to know exactly how much the masonry in the stone fireplace costs. I'm not going to line item out every single thing. An appraiser will, and some other agents believe that that's truly valuable. But for me, I think it becomes entirely too complicated. No home buyer is walking through thinking, oh, that fireplace is worth 5,000. That kitchen countertop is worth two. Those cabinets are 3,500. And oh, I love those wrought iron handles. That's just not what they're thinking. They're going through home by home and they're saying, what's the purchase price? Can I afford this monthly payment? How much money is going to leave my account on the day that I sign? And can I afford my life obligations next? If they like how all of that works out, the second question becomes, is there a better option for me at this price or a lower price? And so when you're trying to market and price your home effectively, I always just look at the comps, both just recently sold in the last three months and what's presently on market because we're not always in a static environment. The three months ago comps will not always indicate next week's value. But when we combine the information that we see from comps three months ago to what's currently active on market, we can get a feeling for how does the home compare? Let's take a home that's worth $500,000. Let's assume that that's the appraised value and that we know that that is also market value. Sometimes market and appraised value are not the same. For this example, let's say that they are. 20 years ago, my parents would have recommended that you list that home for $550,000 in an effort to provide room for negotiation. That way the buyer can come in and offer less and you might still be able to accept the offer. Today, I would never recommend that. I would always recommend listing at or just below market value because right now people are so overstimulated that if they see something that is overpriced, their agent might recommend that they just ignore it they'll have a conversation that sounds like this. Agent, I really like this home. Agent to buyer. Wow, that home is actually $50,000 overpriced. There are six other homes in that area that I'd like to show you instead. Can we go see those? And now all of a sudden, your home didn't get any viewings. They didn't have the opportunity to write an offer on your home because they were advised not to even see it. And so do not overprice your home in this market. If you get too long of a market time, your price is likely the problem. Marketing is great, but it doesn't matter how many open houses or flyers or magazine ads I run. If your home is overpriced, it is not going to sell and there's nothing I can do about it. Marketing is also not just pricing strategy. Pricing strategy is a big part of marketing, but you also need to have an agent that understands negotiation starts the very first time a photo is seen or a word is read. And so when someone sees your Zillow ad, your realtor.com ad, or any of the advertisements that are available online representing and showcasing your home, every detail needs to matter. All of the accurate information needs to be there. Many of you are probably rolling your eyes and thinking that seems like an easy one, but you would be shocked and amazed how easy it is for listings to go live without accurate information. This happens because modifications get made to the home and don't get put on title. Uh, county records are out of date or past listing information was wrong and copied forward without verification. There's a lot of things that need to be done at every type of home price. And so make sure that all of these different things are handled in advance and that the language being used to describe your home is inspiring and makes people want to come take a look at it. 
regardless of if you think you have the right price. And if you think the rest that the agent does is just marketing on the internet, I'm sure I can negotiate it on my behalf. I encourage you to think about the fact that on average, people who rec represent themselves will sell their home for 10 to 15% below what they could have gotten if they had just paid the commission. Everyone wants to run away from the broker commissions because they think 6% is a lot of money. And honestly, when a home is $500,000, 6% is a lot of money. And so my recommendation is that you find someone worthy of that money, and they exist. My family has spent decades honing skills and being ready for anything that can happen. We are prepared, we have the resources, and we know the information that is necessary to protect you and defend you and fix things should anything break during an escrow. And I could spend hours listing the possible things that could happen. The truth is, is that any of them are possible at any time, and having a good representative agent who protects you and defends you at every moment during your transaction is necessary. It's why in my family, we don't believe that you trade agents for individual transactions. You hire a real estate broker to represent you and your family, hopefully for life. And so that's what I'm offering you. If you don't have a real estate broker, please call me. We don't need to go buy or sell anything right now. You might just need advice. I'm here to help you and assist you, and I'm here to be your real estate broker for life. One of the biggest things that I wanna cover on why an agent is necessary it doesn't have anything to do with pricing strategy, and it doesn't even really have to do with marketing or protecting you legally. All of those things are definitely present, but there's this crucial moment in every escrow called the negotiation strategy, where some offer is submitted and it's not perfect. Never in my career, not in 5,000 transactions with my parents and my own office, have I ever seen an offer that everyone was just, yep, this is awesome, it's perfect, there's zero things wrong with it. Sure, we might accept an offer as written, but there's always explanation and knowledge that needs to go along with it. When you're a seller and you're representing yourself, you have to go and negotiate with the opposing broker. It's very unlikely that the buyer is going to come unrepresented. If they do come unrepresented, then two principals are negotiating with each other, and I'm gonna go get the popcorn, because that is a drama series waiting to happen. The reason that agents are useful and valuable is because we remain relatively neutral to each other while honoring confidentiality and massive amounts of commitments that we've made to our individual principal. It's hard for two principals to negotiate against each other because things get taken personally, things get misunderstood, and when that confusion ball starts rolling downhill, it can blow up an entire transaction when nothing bad needed to happen at all. The agents create this buffer between the two principals allowing logic and reason to stand firm in a perfect scenario. <laughs> and of course, agents are people too. So that's why you have to pick a really good agent. You are paying them a lot of money. They are valuable, but you have to pick someone who's competent and good at their job. Otherwise, it could be dangerous. The last few days of an escrow are always the most stressful. Everyone is packed up into boxes. No one knows where anything is. Emotionally, everyone is very denested, and everyone wants the process to be done. So what are some ways that you can make sure that closing goes smoothly for you? Really, make sure your moving is packed and done ahead of time. Do you have a moving truck? Do you have a moving crew? How are you moving your stuff? Have this planned out in advance and really make sure that everyone knows because if you've made the plan but you don't let your broker know, he can't be aware of any other issues that might come up and stop you. So make a plan and then notify your agent. That way he can support you. Get all of your vendors scheduled way in advance. Do not leave everything to the last minute. If you have inspection things to take care of, you are required to do those in advance. Please, please, please do not leave them to the last minute. A lot of people do because, oops, they forgot. And then all of a sudden you've got three days to closing and you have to schedule an HVAC person to come service the furnace. HVAC person can't come until next Thursday. It's Tuesday. You're supposed to close on Friday. Now you're crying into your morning coffee and you could have handled this last week. So just make all of the list of everything that you need to do ahead of time. And if you don't have time, hand it to your broker and ask him to do it. I will help you take care of those things. If they won't, get a new broker. Other big thing, where is everyone physically? You've probably gotten used to electronic signings by now, but your final documents at closing, they have to be wet ink signed. And so if you are taking a safari trip or you're going on an Alaskan cabbage cruise, both of these are real things. Uh, I've had clients call me and say, 
I'm out of country. I'm unavailable. I thought that you would just send me an email. No, everyone has to sign in person. And so if you're traveling, we have to send a mobile notary to you. That can be easy if you're in the middle of Kansas. That can be hard if you're in the middle of the Serengeti. Closing is a stressful time because it's everyone's final check. It is the last three days where anything that you haven't taken care of is gonna pop up and need to be accounted for. And unfortunately, if other people throughout the transaction haven't done their job, then you're gonna be an emergency hell. And so a week and a half ahead of closing, just check in with everyone, have your agent check in with everyone and make sure all of the pieces are taken care of because every transaction is unique. And it's always small things that pop up at closing that piss everyone off. And they're always things that with just a little bit more foresight, I could have handled easily. It's when my client brings it to me in the final hour and says, oh my God, this is an emergency only because we have to handle it in 13 minutes. Well, now I have to scramble the fighter jets and I have to build social capital really quickly in order to pull off a miracle. I will, but it's so much easier if we work through things in advance. All right, everyone, thanks for staying to the end of the video. If there's any questions that we didn't cover, please drop a comment or message me and I'd be happy to answer it privately. As always, thanks for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and tune in to next time. Thank you.